Hello, thanks for joining us. I am Obiora Ilo, and this is your Frontline, your Sunday show. Well, today on our program, of course, if you've been anywhere in Nigeria, you would have heard about the Assistant Inspector General of Police who has detained a journalist uh, for saying that he was controversial. Well, we have Amicha Nakwe in the studio to talk to us about his experience. We'll also be talking to some frontline journalists, sports journalists. They'll be talking about the agenda and the future of the new leadership of NFF after the controversial uh, months of a power tussle. And of course, we'll also be meeting a young Nigerian woman. Well, she is creative and she uses beads to come out with a lot of designs. We'll be talking to her in a moment. But here I have Ame Chanakwe. Amechi, you're welcome to Frontline. Thank you very much. Tell me about detention. You use the word controversial to refer to uh, the period of uh, crisis and it, conflict uh, within the within the NFF. NFF. And I also use controversial to describe you. Yes, that in the was last few days. Exactly the word I used to uh, describe uh, uh, Joseph Mbod, former commissioner of police in Oyo State and River State, and now the assistant inspector chair of police, uh, Zone Seven, comprising of FCT. Uh, Kaduna and um, Niger State that landed me in police detention cell. Tell me about detention. Um, what was the experience? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, all my life, I never imagined for any reason that I'll find myself in detention. For any reason, because I've avoided all forms of trouble. I've lived a simple life. Uh, I wanted, I didn't want anything to do with the police, not to talk of see myself in cell. So when I was being led into cell, I was just, a lot of things were running through my head. What is wrong? Is there anything more than the use of the word controversy? At How long were you in detention? I was in detention for about eight hours. I was eight in detention hours. for eight hours. I reported like I was asked to do, mm -hmm. and I was asked to wait to see the AIG. I was waiting patiently. They excused me from uh, the, my colleague that accompanied me and told the lie to him that they were taking me to see the AIG, why they were leading me into uh, detention. I, they threw me there, uh, where you have uh, suspected criminals, persons of questionable character. Some of them have stayed there up to one year, running, without trial, uh, without having access to family members, uh, just left there to rot and die. I think that cell, some human rights bodies need to have access to those cells to uh, look at the plight of these Nigerians. They need, they need such attention. So when, you know, you went with someone and um, they lied to him and said you were seeing the AIG, when you found yourself in cell, how did you alert your colleagues that? I, I knew it was a design to intimidate me and to harass me into accepting to apologize because they made several requests uh, from, uh, to me that I should apologize to the AIG for using the word controversial. And I told them that I still stand by my earlier argument that, that, that controversial AIG is not is insultive, is not, is not offensive, is not defamatory. That because I believe I did not intend to malign him, nor impugn his character, I was not going to apologize. So I felt they threw me there to soften me and to break me down. Did you see a AIG? I did not. All through your travels? I did not. I was seeing his uh, subordinates, the deputy commissioner of police, the chief superintendent of police, the assistant uh, superintendent of police, and other of office of officers down the line. What, what does this uh, teach you about journalism? Uh, somehow, I was prepared for it because uh, journalism across the world, uh, you have to uh, have some rough encounters. Uh, somehow, over my, my, my long years of practice, I've come to accept the fact that one day I may run into trouble. So I was not taken by surprise. I was prepared psychologically, emotionally for whatever day it is, and I was prepared that day. Uh, in future, it may come. But as much as possible, I'll continue to be professional, I'll continue to avoid trouble, and I'll continue to stick to the codes of journalism. So at what point did they take you out of detention and uh, you ended up in I court? was asked to write a statement the previous day and asked to report again. When I came again, they said they dumped me into the cell. Uh, after five hours, they felt uh, after the uh, inmates uh, have, must have dealt with me, of course, I was brutalized. They brought me out and asked me, to be, started to interrogate me again. 
and said, am I ready to uh, uh, write any apologies? I asked him, take me back there, if that is what you brought me here for. He now asked me to write another statement. I said, I've written an earlier statement. I refer you to that. And I will not write any other statement. I have access to my lawyers. They now, after much hesitation, now give me my phone to call my lawyer. And I put a call across to the office. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people, commentators, have talked about the dark days of the military. I mean, you, you, you have, you've tasted the tension. But sincerely, do you think that the journalist in Nigeria is being intimidated in any way? Do you think that there's some freedom compared with other countries? There's a lot of freedom. I've visited several countries of the world, several African countries, except one or two. I was struck by what I saw in Uganda and Kenya. Uh, very free press, yet there's still some freedom. I think I can write Nigeria third after all this in terms of freedom. Uh, the, the intimidation is there from all angles, coming from long years of military dictatorial rule. The psyche, the attitude and thinking of Nigerians, uh, to a large extent, still flow along that, don't dare the government, don't dare the big man. Uh, that attitude of you uh, having that responsibility to hold them accountable ha has not fully sunk in. But of course... Uh, we uh, have a lot of freedom. We, yes, we have a lot of freedom. There's a belief uh, on the part of the journalists so, that they have a right to pursue their job and they're doing it. So would you say that excesses as exhibited, I mean, excesses by public officers as exhibited by AIG Mbu is an isolated case? It's isolated. And that's why it is the responsibility of everybody to continue to push our democracy and our polity to the next level by ensuring that even these isolated cases are dealt with. Are you going to seek redress in court? Uh, talks are still ongoing. Consultations are still ongoing. Amici, thank you. It means now you're a veteran of, of, of uh, the police detention. Have One you, of the very privileged journalists. Have you journalists. gone through it before? I'm looking forward to it okay. someday. Okay. <laughs> thank you for thank coming you so on Frontline. When we return, we'll be talking sports and we'll be looking at the future and the agenda in front of the new leadership at the NFF. Don't go away. There was nothing democratic about uh, UDJ. The problem with the PDP over the years is imposition of unpopular candidates on the people, on the electorate. This country's democracy will never improve unless those that don't fit are exposed. The bill that we considered for the amendment of uh, our constitution was an executive bill. Israel, they have their law, the law of the forest. It means the stronger animal has full right to kill and to eat the small animal. If the insurgents continue the way it's going, that Jonathan will be the last president of Nigeria because nobody will take this bombing everywhere. Whether it's ISIS in Syria, whether it's Boko Haram in Nigeria, this is a mutual challenge that Nigeria is facing it, Israel is facing it, the international community is facing it. Show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. Start the story with the failure of the African state and not with the colonial creation of the African state, and you have an entirely different story. When we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise.
show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. Start the story with the failure of the African state and not with the colonial creation of the African state, and you have an entirely different story. When we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. We're glad to know you're still with us on your front line. And joining me now is um, Mbulu Austin. Of course, Austin has been around for a long time. He used to be, for, he used to be head of press and protocol at the NFA. Austin, you're welcome. A I also have Ama Ignis, broadcast journalist and analyst, uh, presenter with Radio Nigeria. Um, Ama Ignis, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, in the, in the last couple of months, we've had crisis at the glass house. Who's going to take over? Oh, someone is elected. Oh, they are impeached. Oh, they are returned. Uh, FIFA waits into it. Eventually, in worry, a few days back, we had an election. Let me start with you, Austin. What should occupy the attention of um, Amaju Pinnick, the newly elected uh, NFF uh, a president at this time? Is it time to go to the old fights, or what would you advise? <laughs> well, uh, first and foremost, it has quite a lot to actually uh, uh, think of, because um, um, there are pending issues. There's no two ways about it. Uh, before the elections, there were injunctions. And uh, obviously, in Nigerian law courts, we know quite all right uh, the implication of uh, going against the decision of the courts. Uh, that alone is enough to occupy him for, for, for the first uh, quarter of uh, his tenure because uh, there's need for us to see how best to put the house in order because there are quite a lot of parties that are disenchanted, uh, that felt that uh, they were disenfranchised, and all those that felt that the former election should be upheld. So as a leader, the onus lies on Amaju to try as much as possible to see how best to bring the house together, even though we know quite all right that these issues are out of our control as we speak. They are now in the hands of the judges uh, to really determine or decide what next to do, whether the election will stand or not. Secondly, the issue of football administration, complete development of the game from the grassroots. This is one issue that the previous board has never paid attention to. How best to put a program on ground that will kind of a, be a, a, a kind of a feeder to supply all the national teams beginning from under 13 to the next, uh, to, to, to the Super Eagles. So these are issues that and I he feel you should work on. Focus on immediately. Um, uh, Amma, Ignis, would you support Austin's um, suggestion that first of all he has to start mending fences? Yeah, I want to really agree with him that there is need for a palliative meeting. Uh, because, uh, like Austin rightly pointed out, there are a lot of our grief parties. Uh, we don't have one player's bodies union, talking about NAMF and APFON. Uh, NAMF is uh, being run by Harrison Jala. We have, um, of course, Austin Popo, who was uh, an offshoot of NAMF, heading a parallel player's bodies union. We have a divided NFF. I cannot holistically stand here and say Amadou Pinik is the president of Nigerian Football Federation. He's a factional leader. We have Chris Giwa, who obtained a court injunction. I, I, I learned by way of information um, that there is supposed to be a meeting of all those that have been uh, indicted to report to the uh, Josh Federal High Court on why um, action should not be taken against them for going ahead uh, against the court injunction by held, holding the Wari elective Congress um, on the 30th of uh, last month. So I think there is need for this palliative meeting. Call all our grief parties together and see how everybody can have a uh, uh, focus on the way forward because the football has become the greatest unifying factor in the country. We have become a national and international embarrassment in the eyes of those who have been following keenly the uh, development of football in our country. That being done, uh, I hope uh, the ministry and the sports minister know that they have a role to play because this is a federation under the National Sports Commission, the NSC, uh, which the minister supervises as the chairman of the National Sports Commission. So there is need for them to play a role. And most seriously, uh, you know, if you ask me, 
our judiciary seems to be a laughing stock, in court. Permit me to use that word because um, we have seen cases of abuse or disrespect for injunctions coming from the court. We have seen two lawyers who were giving positions as heads of electoral committee, uh, Amoni Biambo and Sam Sinaboni. And the, uh, Amoni, who swore in Chris Giwa, said he was duly elected. Now we have an, another elect, uh, a lawyer who also was the electoral committee chairman in the worry election who has also sworn in uh, Amaju Pinik, saying he is also duly elected. So this is why the need for this palliative meeting becomes absolutely necessary. Okay, I will ask you, because you're like experts in this sports <laughs> business, you know. Here our courts trying to uphold the laws of our land. And here is FIFA, with its own entirely different approach to it all. FIFA already has recognized the new executive that was elected in Wari. How do we manage this conflict between our laws and FIFA laws. Austin. Well, uh, I think uh, we're walking on a very tight rope, if you ask me, talking about the issue of FIFA and the Federation. The point remains that uh, we got it wrong ab initio. Wrong in the sense that uh, uh, FIFA has not been in the know of what Nigeria is doing. The, the, the feeling is that uh, uh, we, we are in line or in sync with what is obtainable with the rest of the world that are members of the FIFA uh, uh, community. But the truth remains that when we accepted to be members of FIFA, there are laws, and those laws are meant to be domesticated in member countries. I keep saying it. We are yet to domesticate the FIFA statute. If we had, nobody would have had the audacity to proceed to court to get an injunction. Nigerian law supersedes whatever FIFA has. There's no two ways about that. An average scholar knows quite all right that you cannot put a Nigerian constitution and say that this is a FIFA statute and FIFA statute will supersede. No. The truth remains that what we have and what FIFA gave Nigeria is a template to go and domesticate, align all the forces to suit what is obtainable within your environment. But because of the fact that we appear to be too clever, simply because of our greed and the fact that we want to perpetuate ourselves in office, some smart Alex cleverly remove the government completely as if government does not exist. We know quite all right that if you talk in terms of football administration, government funds football in this country 100%. Whatever other companies or FIFA brings a mere drop in the ocean compared to what government unfolds. So invariably, for a man to say that, look, government does not have a say in the day-to-day -day administration of Nigerian football is nothing but a mere fallacy. So what is just there is for us to go back to the basics bring these laws and look at them side by side with what obtains in the Nigerian constitution. Align them so that henceforth, football administration or issues that borders with an administration of football will no longer be subject of our courts and automatically will be in the position to take them completely outside of it. I am surprised that I was to see there is no law in Nigeria today that governs the activities of the Nigerian Football Federation. The only law we have that is still up, uh, uh, in operation is Decree 101 or Act 101 as amended. That act does not recognize what they are presently doing in the Nigerian Football Association. It is nothing but a charity when you compare it with what the decree I stipulates. Want us, I want us to move forward. Um, Austin, you've tried to talk about how we need to navigate between FIFA and our laws. Let's look at some of the challenge, immediate challenges that are facing NFF as we speak. We have, we have this challenge of qualification. We have this challenge of deciding whether we are going with Keshi or whether we are getting another coach. We have this challenge of the, the tussles with the associations and what have you. Um, Ignis, yeah. how should, assuming we resolve all the other variables in this matter, how do we address these immediate challenges? For yeah. every Nigerian, whether um, Mr. A is president or whatever, if we lose this qualification, it's like someone is committing suicide. Uh, yeah, our, our qualification is hanging on the thread. Uh, and um, we have played two games. We lost one at home. For the very first time, we lost 3-2 to uh, uh, Congo. And, of course, uh, we played goalless with South Africa uh, in Cape Town. Now we are playing an away game first with Sudan, and we, they will come to, uh, to Nigeria for a return leg. The, 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 the gist is this. Whether anybody likes it or not, the problem facing the Nigerian football 
association. I like to address them as association because the law of the federal government does not is has not permitted them yet to be called the NFF. That is yet to be um, um, given a, a note by our legislators, those who make laws for us. I remember the chairman of the House Committee on Sports, I did a custom on this, on this, he had told me how much they have pushed this law to ensure that it is no longer NFA, because they collect money as NFA, and then they are called NFF. These are some of the very basic issues that needs to be addressed. Now, Keshi is on a temporary appointment. Because of the issues bothering about uh, uh, the, the imbroglio rocking Nigerian football, the the minister and the, cham the director general of the National Sports Commission, Benga Elekbele, thought it wise to say, okay, what do we do in the midst of all those crises that, has, that is engulfing our football house? We have a qualification we started last month. Let's give Keshi first a contract for the two matches. We have seen the outcome of that match. Now, Keshi is under pressure, whether we like it or not. We are as good as mathematically not going to make it in our group uh, to the next stage of qualifications for Morocco 2015. Now, Keshi does not want to play in Calabar, it is obvious. He wants to see if he could play in Nigeria. I think what they should do is, um, like you said, you, you cannot take it away that the NFF must come together and as soon as possible resolve this crisis because whether anybody likes it or not, it is affecting Keshi's um, comportment, everybody. the players, Nobody's relaxed. There is confusion everywhere. Nobody knows where authority lies. Look at, for instance, when we were to play Congo in Calabar, Chris Giva was there. Megiri and his group were there, but Megiri physically was not present. Now, Chris Giva was stepping down to go and do an official handshake. He, could, he was denied from going to do that. See, all these things are not have not uh, positioned us so, well so in the we, eyes of the international community. So these are some of the crises. So we need to, as a matter of urgency, call a palliative meeting. And resolve this issue. And resolve this issue, if we can. Uh, it is not too far from now when we are playing uh, Sudan. And, but if, it can, if we cannot resolve it, then it behoves on, on Keshi to see how he can manage a crisis reading situation called the Nigerian Football yeah, Association. Yeah, 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 you want yeah, to yeah, come yeah, in? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. That, that, that was a good one. The, you see, the problem, bedevilingly spray goes as we speak, predates the current electoral crisis. The basic problem remains that Keshi had always had issues with, uh, take for instance, the technical committee, a situation whereby full confidence of the board is not reposed in the coach. Definitely, there are bound to be problems. As we speak, there is a high level of distrust between the board and the Keshi, who happens to be the technical advisor of the Super Eagles. For goodness sake, how do you expect a man that has no contract, no salary, nothing to fall back on to give you the best? As we speak, because of a prevailing crisis that has rocked the very foundation of Nigerian football, there is nothing like camping. I remember vividly before now, when we want to play nations like Gam uh, Sudan, what we do is to camp the home base players, bring them together, because that is a very rough and difficult terrain. The weather is so hot, you don't expect your players from Europe coming from cold region to survive in on-demand. Battles of on-demand have always been anchored by home-based players. But as we speak, nobody has given cash money or authority to call camp to begin the process of arranging home-based players. Two days before the thing, professional players will start arriving. How do you get results under such situation? People have blamed him for all manners of whatever. You see, Keshi, before now, opted to leave so that peace can reign, if, he, if they believe that he's a problem. But in the wisdom of government, he was prevailed upon to sit. And now that he's here, they should make available the implement to deliver, which we have not to do. We are yet to do. All we have are paying so much attention on controversies and crises that has more or less uh, threatened to cripple our football. Now, his fate is oscillating to go or not to go. Feelings are, are pointing out that the members of the newly elected board are not favorably disposed to, to, to work with him. Yes. How do you expect a man of Because Because Amadjo Pinnick has been quoted to say that uh, he's not a fan of Keshe. That particular, that, that particular quote, I have issues with it because he's yet to unfold his agenda. But people I, are no, quoting, I, no, I think he and said, we expect him to speak out. I think he said this before, before he was the election. elected. Gentlemen, uh, we don't have time so there's just little we can do. But let's, let me just 
uh, move us a, a, little, a little forward. You know, because of the crisis, we didn't have a situation where we, we, were, we were given the opportunity of even knowing the kind of experience some of the people that are touting to be president. I want to ask two questions. If it's unfair to you, gentlemen, please forgive me. Okay. Do you think that the sports minister has shown sagacity, has shown experience, has shown competence, has shown this ability of being in charge since this whole crisis started? Yeah, I, I want to say um, I'm not really impressed, uh, putting it uh, my own way. I, I, I believe uh, we, had a, we, we, had a po we had pockets of discussion among some journalists to say um, we had every four years it, it appeared to be uh, the known in Nigerian football. Somebody must be sacked from Galadima. And from Galadima, we had a Lulu, who till date is still agitating that he was wrongly removed. And now, Megeri had stayed till an elective Congress, and a new person uh, from Amaju Pinik, uh, from Chris Giva to Amaju Pinik, has been elected. Now, I, I think uh, I was there when the first uh, Congress was called at an hotel in Abuja to say, scenes of Megeri were reeled out, and why Megeri must go. That did not go down well. We, 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 the minister addressed us. I think there are a lot of things I think the minister has actually not gotten right. Um, he appeared to me not to be somebody with too much of experience, especially in the world of sports. We are told that with the way Nigeria is growing, we are advancing, that uh, our political leaders, perhaps from the presidency, should look inwards to ensuring that we have people who, who, who have what it takes to be a sports minister because Look at it, a, a, the Minister of Health cannot be any other person who is not a doctor. Same with the Minister of um, 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 ju uh, Joseph, Justice or whatever. So we need technocrats as those who have the wherewithal, the know-how mm -hmm. to be sports ministers. I am not saying he has not been able to put some things on the check, but the issue concerning this NFF crisis, I think um, the National Sports Commission has not really gotten involved. Austin, they have not you, shown you authority think, because the think, NFF is under Do you them. think that the minister has shown true leadership? In uh, this crisis, I mean, if you ask me, this is a highly technical question. I would say good intention, poor execution. That that is the summary of it all. Good intention in the sense that he has helped Nigerians to rescue their football that was held hostage. There's no two ways about it. Our football before now was in was held hostage by a group of people who arrogate the powers to decide the destinies of this country by themselves. But the mode of modus operandi he adopted appears to be faulty, if you ask me. Because there are quite a lot of technocrats in that ministry that would have been able to deliver a flawless election, handle this thing in such a way that the interest of government is protected, not bastardized, like we have experienced mm -hmm. all these days. But the point remains that uh, it does appear that those technocrats were arrested. For goodness sake, nothing stops somebody who is a novice or, 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 or learning on the job from making inquiries from, from those who have been there. Amos Adamu presided over these things for decades. We never had it so bad. Never had it so bad. Amos, uh, talking about Bola Joe Joba is in the ministry. This is somebody who knows FIFA laws a on the tip secretary. of his finger. Former secretary, member of FIFA, and what have you. We would have availed ourselves of the experience of some of these people if there are no mutual uh, uh, suspicion. Left and, uh, and, and selfish interests. Uh, 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 okay, let me... No, uh, we don't have time, so yeah. let me just go to my, my next question. If Amaju Pinnick, at the end of the day, remains the president of NFF, does he have the experience and capacity? Yes, I want to see yes, because um, Amaju Pinnick is the FA chairman of Delta State. He was a commissioner. He's now the commissioner for sports, uh, using their, their own palace. Uh, he's director of sports, more like a commissioner of sports and FA chairman. He's been there over the years, and I think he's done well. Uh, his experience will come handy. And at least I'm sure that he's also going to be surrounding himself with technocrats who know what our situation is and the fact that we need to bail ourselves out of this quagmire to ensure that football in our country moves forward. I, so think, he has I, think, I think he has it, yes. If you ask me, Amoju has a passion. He's very, a very passionate person about the game of football. I have known him over the years. Knowing his antecedents, his exploits in Delta State speaks volume. He was the former, he in fact, and is 
the Still. chairman of Delta State Sports Council, sports council that is regarded as one of the best in the entire nation, that has maintained consistently top sports when you talk about national sports uh, uh, festival. Mm -hmm. And coming to football administration, he's a football person in Toto. As we speak, he has a legacy that speaks volume. The best secretariat that was ever built by a state FA in this country was constructed by Amaju. But having said that, he needs to work on his character, his person. Quite a lot of people are just scared. They say, look, oh, uh, knowing fully whether he's a temperamental person and what have you, you cannot change his person. All we want is for him to deliver by galvanizing all the forces to avoid falling prey to the destiny of a uh, uh, one time from a uh, chairman of a uh, uh, Nigerian Football Association talking about uh, Mr. Kojo, that was more or less in Kojo. I just hope that those that were elected alongside with him will work in tandem with his vision. And temper his, uh, his, uh, his, his, uh, his, uh, his temper. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people see him as arrogant <laughs> and all that. I must thank you, gentlemen, for yeah. coming. I wish we had more time. Uh, I'm, I'm our Ignis, uh, sports journalist, uh, writer, and presenter. Thanks for coming. Thank you very Austin much. Austin Mbul, former head of press and protocol NFA. Distinguished Administrator of Sports, thanks for coming. The pleasure is mine always. When we return, we talk to a young Nigerian who is using her hands to make very beautiful things. That will be in a moment. Don't go away. There was nothing democratic about uh, UDJ. The problem with the PDP over the years is imposition of unpopular candidates on the people, on the electorate. This country's democracy will never improve unless those that don't fit are exposed. The bill that we considered for the amendment of uh, our constitution was an executive bill. Israel, they have their law, the law of the forest. It means the stronger animal has full right to kill and to eat the small animal. If the insurgents continue the way it's going, that Jonathan will be the last president of Nigeria because nobody will take this bombing everywhere. Whether it's ISIS in Syria, whether it's Boko Haram in Nigeria, this is a mutual challenge that Nigeria is facing it, Israel is facing it, the international community is facing it. Show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. Start the story with the failure of the African state, and not with the colonial creation of the African state, and you have an entirely different story. When we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. You're still watching your frontline on AIT. And joining me is a young lady. Her name is Praise Oluchi Persis. Yes. Did I get that right? Yeah, you yeah well, um, Oluchi is a young Nigerian. Um, she is, you're studying um, network engineering. Computer network engineering. Yes. Okay, she's studying network engineering. but. She, she has a good use of her hands. You, you, you are into what they call bead? Beads and wireworks. Beads and wireworks, something like this. I'm not, a, I'm not a woman. I wish I was. Maybe something like this would have been. <laughs> well, these are the type of things I saw her produce, and I wanted to talk to her about it. So tell me, at what point did you get involved with this? I mean, you are, I, I want to believe that uh, what you're reading has to do with computers. Yes. Does this... Uh, does this deal with computers? Actually, it, it doesn't really deal with computers, but it's a, form of, it's a form of technology because it improves as the year goes by. It improves. So 
and I believe um, this this also showcased the Africa nature. So to me, I think it's better without. Okay, this is a bag. Is this wholly produced with uh, Nigerian input? I mean, this is a bag of beads. Uh, how how do you how 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 what do you use to get this to make this happen? Um, the beads and the fishing line, but actually I don't know where they produce it. But I believe the beads are made of Africa and Nigeria basically. So I believe it's uh, Nigeria. So. Okay, to do a bag like this, how long would it take you? Um, this will go for like four hours. Four hours? Yes. So you could do this, about three, four of this in a day? Sure, yeah. Okay. So um, you, you are unemployed? Yeah. You, you, are, you are, okay, you are unemployed. Does this put food on your table? Yeah, it does. It does put food on my table. It's, it's make, in fact, it's just, it helps me to do most things I want, not only the food. It helps me to take care of myself as a girl, and I think it's okay for me so far. If an average Nigerian girl, we say in the university, of course you hear this challenge of, oh, my parents can pay, pay my way in school. If a young girl like you has this kind of um, know-how, okay. would you be able to sustain her in school, for instance? Definitely. Definitely. I believe most girls have a lot of friends, just make one alone. It will be, if you are able to make one, one of them, people will see it and like it, they will ask you to make it. And with that, you'll be able to earn a living without stress. Okay. What does it take one to learn how to do this? I... Well, let me start with you. How did you learn how to do this? Okay. At first, I had a really big flavor. I really love beads. I love beads and chain, and so I got interest in it. So I had to start learning. At first, my elder sister taught me. From there, I started improving. From there, I went to the school. Um, I got my training from a woman, Mrs. Fumi, and um, she was a really, really um, good woman because she put me through a lot of things that I was lacking behind. And with that, it really helped me because I had someone who was able to encourage me and my parents too. So I think it's, it was very good having, knowing how to make beads. Okay, um, I see something, is this the wire, is the one you call? This is a chain. This chain. is a chain. Yes. Is it, is it a unisex? Can a guy use this? A guy can use this one in particular, but I can make the one guys can use. Well, because I was going to say that you're not gender sensitive. I've not <laughs> seen, <laughs> I've not seen anything uh, for a guy. Your interest in this, yeah. does it have anything to do with being Nigerian, being original, Africa. doing things from Africa, and stuff like that? Yes, I really love Nigeria. And I love my country. So I like wherever I go to, I like showcasing where I'm from. I like, I like people to know I'm, a really, I'm really from Africa, from Nigeria particularly. And I'm proud to be a Nigerian. What, how do you get inspiration to do some of, I mean, to come out with some of, this, some of these designs, you know? Is it, I mean, you are into computer, you have to go design it in your computer or you just design it in your head? No, I design it in my head. I don't really need to design anything in computer. Okay. So, and, and that's it. You just wake up and yeah. you, an idea comes. An idea comes. Sometimes people say, okay, after this, I want this design. Okay, I have to follow what they want. Sometimes I make what I have in my head. So how cheap is this? How, I mean, on the average, who can afford this? Um, can someone like me, I mean, afford, afford something <laughs> like this? Definitely. Everyone can afford it. It depends 
on your taste and choice of the bead you want. We have qualities of bead, different qualities. And if you're demanding for higher quality, you should be able to pay, 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 more, pay more money. money. Yes, pay okay. more money. So it depends on on what one wants. Yes, it depends on what you want. And not so only you have, what you, you want. So you could have beads that will go for like 100 naira, and you could have beads <laughs> that could go for... Uh, there are no beads for your hundred naira, unless you just want a single bangle, and which is going to be so not good. <laughs> okay, so what's the high end? I mean, the kind of beads you've done for people, what will be the cost? Okay, like from two thousand. But it can five, go as it can go as high as hundred thousand. As high as three hundred thousand. Depending on depends the on the quality and the material okay. you made from the bead. You you've learned this. Yes. Are you trying to teach other young girls? Yes, I, I, I have intentions in starting that. And for now, I have about two people I'm putting through in the beat. So, what would, them. so what would be your message to other young people like you? Wow. I, my message to them, I want them to even actually beat. Uh, looks beautiful. <laughs> Looks beautiful. Beads are uh, something that makes you look different and unique. So I, I believe even if some of them don't want to do it to earn a living, they could do it to as, beautify as, themselves okay. and people around them. Okay, Oluchi, I'd like to thank you. Uh, praise Oluchi Persis. Yeah. Um, you, you are reading, um, this is software engineering? Network engineering. Network engineering. Yes. Um, I wish you all the luck, and I, I wish um, that someday maybe you make money from this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's our package on Frontline today. I am Mobi Orilo from Abuja, Nigeria. If you enjoy this, let's do it again. Same time next week. Bye.